This video is a continuation of video four. We're talking about tarot superstitions part two. Okay, since we're having fun here, the end of the last video left off on a tangent about Judeo-Christian or Abrahamic symbolism in the tarot. The point of the tangent is to demonstrate how closely tied to the Abrahamic faiths the tarot actually is. Key 10, the Wheel of Fortune in tarot, is a reference to the medieval symbol for fate. In ancient Greece, the Wheel of Fortune was associated with the astrological zodiac. Around 500 AD, the concept of the Wheel of Fortune became Christianized and used in medieval times as an allegory for religious instruction. For instance, in Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, you had the Monk's Tale, where the allegory of the Wheel of Fortune was used to talk about several Bible story characters, including Lucifer. And look at that devilish creature on the Wheel of Fortune card. Isn't that something? The Wheel of Fortune continued to be an enduring trope throughout medieval European art and Christian art, so it was no surprise that it be found in the early Italian and French tarot decks. The Queen of Swords is often associated with the story of Judith, and if you are familiar with the story of Judith, then the rest of the narrative, beyond the picture frame you see in the actual tarot card, informs the way you might interpret the Queen. Holistic Tarot provides dozens of other such references for understanding tarot imagery and the ways tarot archetypes have manifested in various zeitgeists of history. Now, moving out of Catholicism and Christianity a bit and into Freemasonry, the star card in tarot calls heavily upon Masonic symbolism. As Wait tells us, the star card is l'étoile flamboyante, the gift of spirit, the expression of eternal youth, immortality, and beauty. Dion Fortune described the star card in tarot as a manifestation of Estarte, Aphrodite, Ashtoreth, Hera, Persephone, Diana, and Hecate. When you study the imagery of the star card, you can see the depiction of one who is a giver of life, who nourishes, but this great mother, by the same hand she gives life, she can take it away, and so the potential and capacity to take away life would be the occulted side of the star card. The generic interpretation of the card in a typical tarot reading is that of hope, inspiration, a sense of rejuvenation. However, Waite called the interpretation of the star card as hope, quote, tawdry, end quote, as he tended to encourage exploring the theological, hermetic, masonic, and capitalistic depths of each card. Sidebar. By the way, around this time, 1900s through 1950s, give or take a decade before and after, you're seeing several distinct schools of thought on tarot. Is it fortune-telling? The likes of Aliphas Levy and Paul Foster Case would say no, tarot is not to be used for fortune-telling, but rather it's divination, a tool for communing with God and for us to better understand how we can accomplish our great work. Levy and Case, among others, were resisting against what they perceived to be the dominant approach to tarot at the time, which was to use the cards for fortune-telling. Occult or esoteric tarot and fortune-telling tarot were, as they would have asserted, separate and distinct uses of the tarot. Okay, tangent sidebar over. Back to more tarot superstitions. Here's a fun one. You must be gifted with your first tarot deck. I've heard speculative theories about how this one comes out of historic anti-fortune-telling laws that prohibited the sale of tarot decks, so such a superstition was in some way tied to that prohibition. I really don't know. For me, though, it doesn't matter because it's about intention and interpretation. I feel like the concept of being gifted with your first tarot deck is a figure of speech. Almost everyone you talk to who becomes an avid tarot reader will remark about how they felt called to the path. I believe that's the gift of the first tarot deck, being called to the study of divine nature. When your divine nature calls and seeks to reveal itself through the reading of tarot, then that's the gift of a tarot deck. Another oft-heard superstition is you must store your tarot deck by wrapping it in black silk or just silk of any color. A variation on that myth is a tarot deck must be stored in a wooden box. 
Then there's one about how you cannot store your tarot deck in a metal box, or is it you should store your tarot deck in a metal box? I always forget. True or false? There is only one right way to shuffle your tarot deck. True! The right way to shuffle your tarot deck is the way you want to shuffle your tarot deck. Whether you like to do the overhand shuffle, or you like to do the riffle shuffle and you think this is a tarot reading at a casino, oh my poor cards, or you like to fan out the cards, feel the energies of the cards, then pull the ones you're most drawn to. The right way to shuffle a tarot deck is the way you decide to shuffle your deck. It's all about how you set your own intentions. You shuffle that deck in exactly the manner you want to shuffle that deck. Do individual tarot practitioners have their preferences? Sure, but what's right for me may not suit well for you and what suits you may not suit me. The next one isn't exactly a superstition, but it is a common misconception. When tarot cards appear in reverse, they portend terrible things. Okay, let's talk about reversals. Holistic Tarot teaches you all about reversals and gives an easy-to-remember mnemonic for reading reversals. But you know what? You don't even have to read with reversals. It's a choice you make as a tarot reader whether or not to read with reversals. Some tarot masters do. Some tarot masters do not. If you do decide to read with reversals, the reversal of the card can mean the energies portended are weakened, or it can mean the inverse of the tarot's meaning upright. It can mean that specific energy is having a negative impact on the situation, so it's something to cut out, reduce, or eradicate. Or if the card shows up in a future position, it can indicate delays in the timing of that energy manifesting. Whether to read a reversed card as weakened, inverted, negative impact, or delays will be both an analytical and intuitive process that you go through, a process of elimination, if you will. And again, that's assuming you choose to read with reversals. Back to tarot superstitions. I don't think any of these superstitions are silly, but I do believe they're personal, and it absolutely depends on the individual. I recall as a violinist that I had very specific superstitions around what I had to do before an important audition or before going on stage to play a solo. And I was by no means the only one. Lots of musicians are superstitious. There's a certain necklace they have to wear. There's a certain lucky charm they have to have in their violin case. Athletes are superstitious too. One might refuse to ever wash her baseball cap. Another has to do a very specific personal ritual prior to a game. Teams may have very specific prayers they must recite or hand signs they must perform with each other prior to a match. Sports is steeped in tradition, superstition, ritual, and ceremony. Rationally, I don't think anyone would say there's a direct causal relationship between the superstitious act and the success of the outcome. It's about how certain rituals make us feel, and yes, a lot of times those superstitions are illogical, are rooted in emotion or sentimentality. For instance, the necklace the musician must wear before going on stage was a necklace gifted to her by her grandmother whose dying wish was to see her granddaughter thrive in the music world. Or maybe it's a necklace that represents her religious faith, and so the necklace is a symbol of her closeness to divinity. Either way, it holds emotional value, and emotions hold power, lots of it. Our emotions give superstitions their power. It's okay to hold on to superstitions like having to wrap your tarot deck in silk or store it in a wooden box or only cutting your deck with your left hand. Oh yeah, that's another superstition. You must cut your tarot deck with your left hand only because the left hand is closest to your heart. Okay, full disclosure, I only cut my tarot deck with the left hand, and when you sit down for an in-person tarot reading from me, you might notice that I instruct you to shuffle the deck and then cut it with your left hand. That's just my thing. It's totally personal. I cut the deck with my left hand because in the metaphysical realm, my left hand is dominant. Here's the real reason I cut the tarot deck with my left hand only. I'm a creature of habit. That is how I was taught. So this was how I did it in the beginning, and as a creature of habit, it's how I continue to do it now.
rationally, you should understand that you don't have to follow tarot superstitions, that there is no logical causal relationship between one and the other. Emotionally, if adhering to superstitions helps you to honor the sacred arts and strengthens that deeply emotional and intuitive connection between you and your tarot deck, then I say go for it. So by that same account, don't make fun of people who do adhere to superstitions. It's an emotional, sentimental thing. Don't belittle people for their emotions and sentimentality. Here's the important thing to remember. What's emotional and sentimental to me is going to be different from what's emotional and sentimental to you. Neither one should judge the other for it. I believe I need to keep certain lucky charms in my violin case, especially when I'm performing at a concert. But I'm not about to go around telling everybody who plays the violin that all violinists must carry the same lucky charms. You do what you've got to do, but you know, you also live and let live. Okay, here's another one. Will you lose your psychic powers or connection to spirit if you use your gifts for enabling greed? If you use your tarot cards in any way to make money, your readings will stop being accurate. No, that's another endearing superstition. Greed itself would be the reason why you might be feeling lost and therefore lose your connection to intuition. It's not the pack of cards that gives or withholds power. It's all in your head. You can't lose your psychic abilities the way you lose your socks. Tarot reading, even psychic reading, is a skill and knowledge that you carry with you always. You can get rusty at it the way you get rusty at any craft when you're out of practice, but you don't lose it because you did something that has angered the tarot gods. Again, as I made reference to in the previous video, do not assign your power or your vices to the pack of cards. Your strengths and your weaknesses rest with you. Take ownership of the fact that maybe your newfound greed is clouding your judgment. Take ownership of the fact that external factors going on in your life is causing you to be mentally and emotionally distracted. A pack of cards does not give or withhold power. It's your conscience and your mental state. You may have heard before that you must routinely cleanse the energy of your tarot deck. Again, we need to acknowledge that this is a matter of belief systems. Instead of asking the question, do I need to energetically cleanse or consecrate my tarot deck, ask yourself, what do I believe? Then answer the first question through the framework of your beliefs. Here's what I like to do for no other reason except it makes me feel happy. I give the cards a good, hard, solid tap against the table, visualizing any unwanted energies like dust sliding right off the cards. Then I pass each card one by one through the smoke of frankincense or sandalwood incense. Over each card, I'll recite a specific mantra for consecration. I like to do all of this during a full moon, and then I leave the cards out with a selenite crystal on top of it under the full moon light. I do this fairly regularly with the tarot decks that's in frequent use, but I don't do this with all my decks. The ones that are just for collecting that I don't really use don't go through this procedure. Hey, look, if it makes you feel funny to do all that superstitious -y, mystical full moon crap, then don't do it. Just read the cards. If it makes you feel funny to not do it because then you're sure your cards are dirty with all sorts of old atrophic energies, then do it. Go ahead and consecrate your cards. No matter which camp you fall into, here's what you should not do. Don't side eye the other camp and look down on them. One more piece of lore. How about tarot is witchcraft? Well, it can be. Rice is what I cook for dinner. Or it's what I use to cast hexagrams in an I Ching divination. Or I add it as a metaphysical ingredient in spellcrafting. So is rice witchcraft? Well, it can be. Or it can just be what's cooking for dinner. Tarot is what your mind and intentions make of it. Superstitions are born out of our emotions. And as it is with emotions, they hold power only if you give it power. At all times, the power rests with you, the power to control the narrative. 
and the power to give up your power and surrender it to an inanimate pack of cards. With these tarot superstitions, it's a matter of personal preference. No one should ever make you feel less than about following superstitions, especially if following them makes you feel better. But by that same token, never feel like you need to or that you're doing it wrong if you don't. In fact, you're probably the more rational one if you don't follow any of these silly superstitions. Why do we get superstitious in the first place anyway? When we know we can't control the outcome of a situation, we employ superstitions as a way to feel in control. If we just do this and that, then the gods are going to shine favorably down upon us and things will turn out exactly the way we want them to. We need to be gifted our first tarot deck so that we can feel special, like the fates have chosen us for this path. It, it validates us. It gives us proof to others that the universe has declared that we were meant to become tarot masters. We need to wrap our tarot decks in silk or cut our decks in this particular way and no other, so we feel in control of the deck's magic. Ultimately, superstitions are revealing of insecurities. So the moral of this video is to enjoy the emotional value of superstitions that you indulge in, but never ever impose those same superstitions onto others. And please, please do not perpetuate more myths in this already myth-ridden field. What myths, superstitions, and common lore around the tarot fascinate you? Share in the comments section of this video for posterity so others who see this video and read your comments can learn.